Are you letting people in? I am not. Would you like me to? I, for some, oh, you have to make me co-host. Okay, let me do that. Okay, got it. People just joining us, we are getting ready just to start our program with Jane O'Neill, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a medieval fantasy. We're just letting people in. We'll do our usual introductions and then um, move forward, turning things over to Jane. So as always, uh, we are recording this and making it available for future. Um, and also, um, inviting people to our next program, which will be December 4th at 3 p.m. That's going to be Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. Um, so I will move forward with our formal introductions. Thank you again, Marnie, for letting people in. Uh, my name is Dana Mastriani. I'm the assistant director here at the Rockport Public Library, and thanks for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. We've got a great program today, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a medieval fantasy with Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious. Um, our other partners besides Rockport today are the Burlington Library, Medford, Hamilton Wenham, North Andover, Groton, and of course, uh, Rockport. Um, we have placed the chat inside the chat, the link to the December program. So if you're up and running and want to get ready for December 4th, please um, click on that link. We've also put some spellings of some names to some of the key people who will be discussed today, just for those who um, are not great spellers like myself or for others who don't hear as well. Um, we will ask everybody to remain muted, if you could, please. That helps to cut down on the barking dogs or clanging dishes in the background, which is always problematic. Um, please put your, your um, questions in the chat. Um, if any of you have seen Jane before, you know she's going to use her full hour and always circles back for an opportunity for us all to ask questions. If you're like many people, myself included, you may forget that question by the time the end of the program comes. So if you put it in the chat, we will serve those up for her. Um, I uh, Let's see if I touched on everything. I think we have. So um, I think without further ado, we will send this over to Miss Jane O'Neill. Um, oh, just a little introduction, excuse me, to the program. Um, the program, um, as it's written, will provide an introduction to the pre-Raphaelites of the 19th century and look at the paintings of leading members, including William Holman Hunt, Dante Gabrielle Rossetti, and John Williams Waterhouse. Learn about the roots of the British movement and see how the artist's fascination with the medieval past romanticism and realism led to a beautiful style that lasted more than a half century. A little bit about Jane, she holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Um, she's worked at some of the New Hampshire's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art where she held the role of senior educator. She's also ta taught art history at the college level for more than a decade and most recently at the Southern New Hampshire University. So thank you as always, Jane. We look forward to having you today. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you everybody for taking time out of your Sunday to learn a little bit more about the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. This is a program that is a lot of fun. It's a little bit different from some of my other programs if you've attended those, but it is, it's deep and it's rich. There's a lot to cover. Um, having said that though, I, my husband who is very into anything medieval was sort of geeky out on the content with me today. And so he encouraged me to bring in my medieval times goblet, his medieval times goblet to sort of celebrate the theme. 
So um, we're going all in on the medieval uh, period, but the pre-Raphaelite period, uh, the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood really dates to around mid 19th century. And these images are beautiful, they're dense, they're detailed and packed with symbolism. But in some ways, they're still a reflection of their times. Um, we'll see a little bit of anxiety sort of creeping into some of these images about um, the role of women in particular in modern society. And so we should remember that the world is still turning as these artists are creating this work, even though their minds and their, and their artwork is so trained on the past. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together, We'll um, start off with an introduction to some of the most important pre-Raphaelite artists and then turn our attention to how to spot a pre-Raphaelite painting. Um, what are some general characteristics to look for? And then I've sort of broken up the rest of the program into these four sections, medieval fantasies that are inspired by religious traditions, historical traditions, literary and legendary traditions. And then we'll fi finish up with the legacy of the movement. Uh, I just love this image over here. And since it's about time, I thought it was a good place for it in the program overview. This is a painting by uh, a female artist named Eleanor Brickdale, and it was painted in in the 20th century, it's always a good reminder to know that this, this, um, this artistic movement lasted for so long, but this is called Time the Physician. And of course, we know time heals all wounds. So Father Time here is uh, tending to a wound on this uh, soldier's head here. And so that's just to frame up our, our uh, the way we'll be spending our time together today. So let's get started with an introduction to our artists. So the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was a distinct group of young men who came together right around the middle of the 19th century. And we have the leaders of this movement in painted portraits across the top. From left to right, we have a self-portrait by William Holman Hunt, a self-portrait by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and he's really the name that you hear the most when it comes to the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and then um, John Everett Millet over here on the right. Now, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood started off as like this secret society of young artists and writers. They were founded in London in 1848. Now, like so many young men <laughs> of any generation, they wanted something to rebel against. And in this case, they were rebelling against conservative Victorian painting. And they, they were longing for something different, something that they called or sort of referred to as the simplicity and the clarity of medieval Italian art. So this is what they were um, aiming for when they're talking about pre-Raphaelite, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to what that really means in just a moment. So these young men, along with the boys in, in the bottom row, uh, sort of this the second tier here, we have a painter named James Collison, um, a poet and a sculptor, really the movement's only sculptor, an artist by the name of uh, Thomas Woolner, and then uh, William Michael Rossetti, he's the brother of Dante Gabriel Rossetti over here, and then jo uh, Frederick George Stevens um, down here on the lower right, he was an art critic primarily. So you have writers, sculptors, painters, and um, and I think it's important to know that these young men, these uh, these rebels here, they were a little bit of like a brat pack of their day. They, they knew how to get uh, attention for their artwork. They knew how to market their artwork and they were doing something sort of different and mysterious for their time. So they, um, they thought of themselves as a reform movement. They even started publishing a newsletter called The Germ. But like so many young revolutionaries, they abandoned, essentially abandoned and disband the Brotherhood after about five years. And so we'll see that other, other artists sort of pick up the torch along the way. So let me give you a sense of other things that they were rebelling against. These artists were attending the Royal Academy of Art. And um, the founder of the Royal Academy of Art was an artist by the name of Sir Joshua Reynolds, who we see in a self-portrait over here. 
Reynolds was long dead by the time the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was attending school, but they wanted to rebel against somebody. So they were going to rebel against Reynolds. And this is a great example of the way that Sir Joshua Reynolds painted. This is his picture called Jane, the Countess of Harrington from 1778. Now this kind of grand manner portraiture was something the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood had a real disdain for. Um, let me give you a sense in terms of how they would do something like this differently. They thought of the Reynolds paintings as being sort of artificial and um, and, and sort of uh, out of touch with, with modern times. And so instead they would offer up an image like the one that we see over here on the right. And this is painted by an artist named um, Sandys, Frederick Sandys. And it's his painting of a woman, a historical figure named Queen Eleanor, dates back to like the 1100s. But it's both beautiful women in these pink dresses. And you can see all around Queen Eleanor, there is, um, this incredible greenery and a real attention to the kinds of um, the kind, the different kinds of plants that are there. There's a there's a detailed attention to her costume as well, to every strand of her hair. So um, so the easy sort of looseness of the paint over here that we see in Reynolds' painting is done away with. It and it and like I said, it's really sort of disdained. Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood painters are looking for crisp details, natural elements in their paintings, and having everything carefully described. Now, this name, Pre-Raphaelite, what exactly does this mean too? Well, of course, it refers to the Renaissance master, Raphael, the painter whose work that we see an example of over here on the right. This is his Madonna of the Goldfinch, uh, painted around 1506. Now, Raphael is known for these very clear depictions of divine figures. He makes them beautiful. The compositions are very rational. We've got a, a clear, pyramidal composition here with the figures sort of neatly laid out, very clear and precise storytelling. If we contrast that with something by say Botticelli, who was a generation or so younger, came before pre, uh, uh, Raphael, a pre-Raphaelite, we have um, just the opposite. We have something that is a little bit chaotic, a little bit mysterious, um, but something that is still so incredibly um, described in terms of detailing. So if you're familiar with Botticelli's painting Primavera, you might know, for example, that all of these different plants and flowers down here, botanists have been able to identify more than a hundred species of plants and flowers on the ground here because Botticelli was so dedicated to that kind of detail in his painting. And this is the sort of thing that the Pre-Raphaelites would have loved. They love that there's some mystery in terms of uh, the storytelling here. Our art historians are still debating who exactly all of these figures are and what is unfolding in this, in this strange work called Primavera. So, um, so there's a couple of different layers, of course, to these Pre-Raphaelite artists. But just to underscore this interest in Botticelli, I just want to share with you another painting by this artist Eleanor Brickdale and she's really kind of a late practitioner of pre-Raphaelite painting. This is her depiction from the 1920s actually of Botticelli, her imagined rendition of Botticelli in his studio being introduced to the great beauty of his time. So it's a pre-Raphaelite artist imagining a fantasy of really what this late Gothic artist's uh, workshop would have been like. And most importantly, she is describing this relationship between an artist and his muse. You meet somebody beautiful and she helps to shape your work. So the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood wasn't just a boys club per se. There were a lot of female artists who were participating and there's more and more um, interest in them, their lives and their artistic outputs. But um, not only were they painting, they played a huge role as models. So these three images relate to the woman named Elizabeth Seidel. Now she was sort of the pre-Raphaelite supermodel. She had all of this red hair. She was a really striking figure, but she also married Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the leader of the movement, and then became an artist in her own right. So this is um, Rossetti's marriage portrait of, of um, Elizabeth Seidel. This is Rossetti. Uh, 
his sketch of his wife sketching at her easel. And then over here on the right is a painting by Seidel herself called Lady Claire from 1857. So there, and along the way today, you'll see examples of works by other um, female artists as well. So just to kind of wrap up this quick introduction, um, as I mentioned, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was a group of young guys and they had this revolutionary idea and then they sort of go their separate ways after just five years. But a few of them sort of keep the torch going. And then there are other very devoted practitioners like Edward Byrne Jones, who we see over here on the left, and William Morris, who kind of picks up the torch a little bit later um, in the 1970s and 1980s, or sorry, 1870s and 1880s. So, um, so it's a style that is around for a long time, but those founding me members that were a little bit of a flash in the pan with this original idea. So let's, let's take a sort of a, a deeper look in terms of what it means to be a pre-Raphaelite painting. How do you spot one in the wild? Um, well, first and foremost, um, you're going to notice some very vivid and beautiful colors. Uh, this is a painting by John Everett Millet called Mariana from 1851. And I mean, if, if it doesn't just take your breath away, the blue of this velvet dress, these really vivid reds coming through the stained glass window in front of her, uh, the, the pre-Raphaelite artists really loved these uh, bright saturated colors, this jewel-like color palette. And they were painting on directly on white canvases in order to achieve this, this really sort of saturated color. The blues and the reds tend to really stand out. And the intention there was that they would look like medieval stained glass. This is a stained glass window from Chart Cathedral that dates to about 1100. So even though we're in the middle of the 1800s, these artists really do have their minds trained to the Gothic era a, a, a lot of the time. Now, um, these artists are also thinking of literary references, what have you. So in this case, the woman in this gorgeous blue dress would have been from uh, Shakespeare's Measure by Measure and, um, and then would have been sort of resurrected in a certain sense, sense by a 19th century poet. So it's a familiar subject. It would have been familiar to audiences of the time, but the, these pre-Raphaelite artists can describe her in this kind of stunning detail and place her in this particular setting that sort of transports all of us back to this particular period of time. Another thing that we're going to see a great deal of in these paintings is um, this fascination with the natural world and, um, and an ability to describe it, a dedication to describing it like you've never seen before. This is William Holman Hunt's the Haunted Manor from 1849. What a great title, right? And we do see this sort of uh, um, forlorn looking uh, estate in the background, but really his eye is completely trained on the natural world, on the forest floor here. And we see this little waterfall spilling over and we get the description of all these different grasses and plants here. Now, um, a lot of these artists were actually painting the natural world outside on plein air, sort of the, the way that the French Impressionists were doing, but doing it, but they were doing this a couple of decades earlier and they weren't going for impressions. They were going almost for like a botanist level of detail in their work. And it really makes their works stand out. So it, in this work and in so many others, you sort of get the sense that that um, you're in these spaces and your eye is trained downwards. Like we are supposed to be focusing on the natural world here. Now going hand in hand with an interest in the, the natural world um, and a dead giveaway that you're looking at a pre-Raphaelite painting is an interest in flowers and the symbolism of flowers. This is John William Waterhouse's uh, painting, Gather Ye Rosebuds While You May from 1909 just a gorgeous painting in and of its own right. These lovely women in these sort of diaphanous gowns here, gathering up the, the flowers and then approaching this rose bush here to pick these pink roses, which are a symbol of grace and elegance and first love. And of course it has a literary reference here where um, 
to the 17th century poem by Herrick, um, to the virgins, to make much of time. I think we're all sort of familiar with the phrase, gather ye rosebuds while ye may, or time is still a flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Um, it, we've all seen our um, Dead Poet Society. So, you know, it's carpe diem. And here's just a detail of those incredible flowers. Now, th these artists were painting at a time in Victorian England where, um, where communication uh, was always sort of standing on ceremony. <laughs> you couldn't have an informal chat with someone. And so, um, so it, it became standard to kind of communicate through flowers, especially if you were a man communicating with a woman. So flowers took on um, these deep symbolic meanings for the most part, positive meanings, but there were um, there were some uh, sort of negative combinations that you could get in there as well. So there were these subtle coded messages that could be um, communicated through the inclusion of a flower in a painting, or of course through a flower as a gift. So. During the Victorian era, you have all of these flower dictionaries that were being published. And so, um, you know, you could go back to your little dictionary and decode exactly what somebody was trying to tell you uh, through a bouquet that they've assembled there. So there are all sorts of important flowers in these works. This is a remarkable painting by the leader of the movement. This is Dante uh, Gabriel Rossetti's painting of Lady Lilith from um, 1868. It's this sort of massive woman with this really strong facial features, these str the strong jaw and this incredible head of red hair here. And Lady Lilith is from the Judaic myth. She is at the first wife of Adam essentially, and she's a symbol of temptation and seduction. And here she's, you know, combing her hair and she's gazing at her own reflection in the mirror. She is aware of the power that she has because of her beauty. But the flowers here help us understand a lot of the picture. Um, let's see, so we've got some white roses. Tend, uh, they are oftentimes associated with Lady Lilith because the white rose is really, um, it's, it's before there's passion, it's before there's love. Sometimes it can, um, it can remind us of a, of a colder love, a love that is not as sensuous. And um, uh, it, it was said that roses didn't blush until Adam met Eve. So this sort of stands before that. And then we have this uh, very prominent poppy right down here at the bottom, which of course symbolizes sleep. We remember that reference from the Wizard of Oz probably. And it probably hints at Lilith's sort of languid nature in this particular picture. So. Um, so what we'll see, uh, she, she's a good segue to just sort of thinking about women in general in um, pre-Raphaelite paintings, because she's this symbol, she's a symbol of power, certainly, but she's also a symbol of vice. And women are like a shifting symbol for a lot of these artists between vice and virtue. And because this is a rare depiction of a contemporary woman, we can see how a lot of these anxieties about women's role in um, Victorian life are kind of bubbling up in Victorian, uh, it, well, in pre-Raphaelite paintings. So this is William Holman Hunt's incredible picture called The Awakening Conscience. It's from 1853. And what we see here in this picture is a woman who is having an, a moral awakening. And, um, and so she is rising up off of the lap of her lover. Notice that she doesn't have a wedding ring. So she is understood to be his mistress. And she's, uh, we can see from the mirror behind her that she is looking out into this like illuminated garden here and suddenly realizing that her life was on the wrong path. This is a moment of redemption, really. So sometimes pre-Raphaelite artists give us women with some psychological weight and some agency, and sometimes they are, um, they're just giving us damsels in distress, and there are plenty of them as well. <laughs> so over here on the left, we have a painting by John Everett Millay. It's called The Errant Knight from 1870. And then over on the right, this 
unbelievable picture. This is actually a watercolor painting that we're looking at on the right by an artist named Frederick William Burton. And it's called The Meeting on the Turret Steps from 1864, where we see two lovers kind of passing each other by um, and having like an illicit connection there in the turret. So we oftentimes see these women, these damsels in distress because um, so much about the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood is connected back to these, um, these, this fantasy about uh, Arthurian times, you know, the, even, you know, the, the term brotherhood comes to reference, comes from references to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So these artists love to think about the, the, the this, this historical past and the sort of fantasy that they had around it with this knight who is saving this, this um, nude woman who's been tied to a tree here. You can see her clothes down below out of modesty she looks away but her captors in the moonlight are running off and his sword is covered in blood he is there to save her he's vanquished the enemy so um so we get the sense that that these artists are going to be looking to writers and poets that reference the medieval past so, so they can use it as a subject as often as possible sometimes going back to this idea of women being both vice and virtue, sometimes women really do play the role of the villain in these pictures. This is an image called um, The Beautiful Lady Without Pity. It's painted by John William Waterhouse in 1893 another stunning image. I feel like we could just look at one of these paintings for like a half an hour and take it apart. But in this picture, we have a knight who sort of derailed on his quest by this beautiful lady that he encounters in the woods. And she has completely ensnared him. She's taken her hair and wrapped it around his neck and she's pulling him in closer here. He can't take his eyes off of her. And she just is recognizing this power here. Now, ultimately in this story, she's going to leave him for dead <laughs> in the forest. So she really is the villain in this scene. Otherwise you would just think, you know, there's like a little heart right here. It's just um, purely a, a, a romantic scene here, but, but it really does sort of bubble up from some anxieties that these young men had about their relationships with women. Now, we'll finish up with this idea of this interest in the medieval past with just a few sort of um, quirkier examples from the later part of the pre-Raphaelite pre movement. I really do love this artist named Eleanor Brickdale, who is working in the early 20th century. This is her painting called Chivalry Dying of Love for the Goddesses. And, you know, they look like they're swooning because they can't even handle the, the imagined beauty in front of it. So we have all of these men in armor. We get the sense that we're looking at the medieval past and that these medieval knights are, um, are, are, are literally fainting because of the of the, the symbolic heft of these beautiful goddesses in front of them. There's always another layer to these paintings because the artist painted this around um, the, uh, the period of World War I. This is also probably a reference to trench warfare and, um, and the death of, of, of so many British soldiers uh, who were dying for high ideals like patriotism and sacrifice to their country. So always a couple of different layers there. But I, you know, you, whenever you see the knights in armor, it, it's such a good tip off that we're looking at something pre-Raphaelite. So we'll end um, this section with one last look at a painting from Eleanor Brickdale. It's called The Challenge. This is actually a watercolor painting. That it always knocks my socks off whenever you see colors so vivid in a watercolor painting. And it's simply called The Challenge. And the challenge here is love versus death. And of course, we know when it's true love, it's death is the only thing that can separate you. And so we have this very confident uh, representative of love who's taken off his glove, he's throwing down the gauntlet in this battle, but we can see uh, you know, what an impressive force 
death is over here. We have this uh, cloaked figure standing in black. We have this soldier on a shrouded horse with skull and bones. We even have another armored medieval knight here with a skull on top of his armor. So we know, we know that in the end, death always wins out, but it's a nice romantic story that Brookdale gives us here. So let's turn our attention now to the way these pre-Raphaelite artists wove their medieval fantasies through these different kinds of paintings. So we're gonna turn our attention first to religious paintings and take a look at how, how you make them medieval. All right, um, we are looking at this gorgeous painting by John Everett Millay. This is really one of the first real pre-Raphaelite paintings. It dates to 1850 and it's called Christ in the house of his parents. And so you might be thinking, this seems like a really safe subject for one of these artists. I don't really see how it relates to these medieval knights that we've been looking at. What makes this medieval? I promise you, I will, do, I will get to that for you. I will say that because these artists are so dedicated to um, describing minute details. You can see, for example, the wrinkled forehead of Mary here as she's kissing the young Christ child. You can see these kind of skinny, sinewy arms on, um, on Joseph, who's our carpenter here. And you get all of the detail of his workshop as well. Now, there is just a little too much detail here for um, modern day, uh, uh, Brit uh, the, the modern day British the audi audience. Even Charles Dickens wrote that this painting was blasphemous. And part of the reason was because they felt like the family of Christ here was just too ugly, that, um, that you know, Joseph's arms were, were grotesque and that Mary here wasn't made divinely beautiful. So instead, um, what, what our artist um, Millet is trying to accomplish here is to create these sort of bent over figures like you might see in a van der Weyden altarpiece from um, much earlier on, from centuries earlier, probably the, the 1400s here. And, and so he's working a world away from the traditions of an artist like Raphael who could make everything so clear and yet so beautiful at the same time. Audiences did not like what he was going for over here, but once again, those vivid blues and reds really caught the eye of contemporary audiences. Another very well-known religious painting that's also pre-Raphaelite painting is called The Light of the World by William Holman Hunt. And you can see that there are two versions of it here. You can see the, the title um, in this elaborate frame on the right. It dates to about 1853. And the image is a pretty, uh, pretty standard from one to the next, although you can see that, that the face of Christ sort of changes in the later version. Now, what we're looking at here is, um, is a depiction of Jesus with a lantern in this really sort of elaborate crown and elaborate cloak with, uh, you know, all of these jewels at, um, at, the, at the fastener right here on his chest. And he's walking up to what almost looks like an old barn, a door that has not been opened in a long time. And there's no handle on that door. It can only be opened from inside. And so this is representative of the idea that if you were to follow Christ, you are the person inside that has to open the door for, you, for him. He can knock, but he can't come inside. You have to make that decision. Now, Christ has a halo over here, and there's a, also a star in the sky just above his head, sort of uh, representing that, that notion of, of sort of guiding him. Um, over here, it almost looks like the moon is behind him. Uh, notice, too, that this lantern that he's using, this would have been a horn plates lantern where they didn't have glass really in, uh, in this period so um, in this medieval period that they're referencing so this would have been very thin cut bone to make this kind of gothic style lantern that we're looking at so a lot of the um, the ornamentation to this picture is very medieval or at least medieval inspired. And, and this was such a popular image, it essentially traveled around the world for two years after it was painted and has become a really iconic image 
in British culture ever since. All right, so let's keep moving on at a few and look at a few other connections between the pre-Raphaelite medieval fantasy and religious painting. What a powerful picture this is here. This was painted by Edward Byrne Jones and it's called The Merciful Knight. Now he's, um, he's painting a little bit later than that original group that we saw. So this is 1863 and what a fascinating image here. We have a medieval knight who's walked into sort of this simple structure here that has a life-size crucifixion and um and this this uh, essentially this carved christ this wooden christ has sort of come to life has been activated by the knight's penitence here and he leans forward wraps his arm around the knight who has already put down his um sword and his helmet and and his um and his gauntlet and and he embraces him and he kisses him almost like a parent and so this is a specific reference to a story about um, a medieval knight who had the opportunity to get vengeance he saw the man who had killed his own brother and decides against vengeance but he's like filled with emotion after deciding against vengeance and he goes to pray on it and we see this image of Christ embracing him just below this little altar shrine that they're inhabiting we see all of these marigolds these orange flowers and they are representative of grief in this case so all of this great detail all of these layers of storytelling embedded in here here's just a detail of that embrace and you can really see the grief in the face of this knight and how he essentially needs this extra support in this moment that the artist is offering up to him through the, the body of this um, icon of Christ. So another religious scene is um, this depiction of St. Cecilia from 1895. It's painted by the artist John William Waterhouse. So it's supposed to be a religious painting set in sort of Roman times. And we see some, some rough um, references to it, but really so much of this looks medieval, doesn't it? I mean, from the dress here to the illuminated manuscript on her lap, um, uh, this all seems to be sort of uh, a, a mishmash of time periods coming together here. Now, yeah. Saint Cecilia is the patron saint of um, music and musicians. And during her life, she took, she uh, essentially declared that she would remain abstinent. She would remain a virgin. And she also wouldn't listen to music because she wanted to keep her soul pure so that she could hear the, heaven, the, the music of heaven, essentially. So while she's sleeping, these angels come to her and make music for her. And that's her sort of um, connecting with, um, with her higher power in this beautiful moment. Now, all of these roses around her also have symbolic meaning because when uh, St. Cecilia actually does get married, her husband also takes a vow of celibacy. And instantaneous to that moment, these angel, this angel, her guardian angel, descended from heaven and gave them both um, crowns of red roses. So we see the roses throughout here and then also some, some white roses over here that were to signify her purity. Now, I just have to very quickly show one of my favorite religious paintings of all time. It's an Annunciation scene also by William, uh, John William Waterhouse. This is a little bit later, 1914. And there aren't a lot of um, great medieval references in this picture, other than the fact that you know, in the in this image, we have the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, telling her that she's divinely pregnant, and she has sort of an uh, unusual reaction to this news. Oftentimes, artists show. Um, Mary with her hands crossed over her chest, sort of receiving this news. And in this case, Waterhouse portrays Mary with one hand on her heart and one hand on her head. It's though she's sort of struggling to, um, to, to deal with this new information. What is that? Both emotionally and, um, 
and intellectually. Oh my God. So in this case, oh, I just want to make sure that um, everybody has their, um, has themselves muted. Thank you. So in this case, um, I think what, what our best connection back to medieval times here is the symbolism of flowers. Of course, we always see um, uh, irises here, uh, white irises being a connection back to, or white lilies, I should say, being a connection back to Mary's purity. But these big angel wing sleeves that she has on, we're going to see that they really typify the, the medieval period. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of very similar dresses in this case. So to wrap up on religious painting and how it relates to um, the pre-Raphaelite medieval fantasy, I have a picture that's not medieval at all, but it, it shows how adept these artists are at weaving in um, religious stories into their pictures. So the artist here is named Ford Maddox Brown, and it's called The Last of in England from 1855. And so it's a story of uh, contemporary times. Uh, there was uh, historic emigration out of England during this time. And the artist himself thought, I might move away with my family. We might pick up and move to, um, to India. But in this case, he painted a depiction of his friend who was moving to Australia. And they were doing so on a boat. You can see the water surrounding them. You can imagine that this would be a hard, long journey. And so we have a husband and wife sitting together trying to, to sort of buoy each other in this moment, protect themselves from the elements. They're holding hands, they're looking off into their, into their future together. But the detail that I always love here is that there is a babe in arms. And you can just see that little tiny baby hand and the suggestion of the baby's head here. So in so many ways, it is like a, a depiction of the Holy Family. Um, so it's another great way that these pre-Raphaelite artists have kind of woven in um, elements uh, to make their, their, their pictures have, have sort of a deeper meaning, multiple layers to them. All right, so let's switch gears for just a moment. And we're going to turn our attention away from religious paintings to history paintings. And history was... Um, uh, a, a great source of inspiration for these pre-Raphaelite artists. Uh, Eleanor Brickdale, we'll see uh, many examples of her work today. This is her depiction of the historical figures from the 12th century, um, Heloise and Abelard. Now this is a painting from 1919. It was actually part of a book that she published about famous historical women. Now you might be familiar with this duo here. Um, Eloise was a French nun and scholar and she had an epistolary romance with this theologian and, um, and, and philosopher named Peter Abelard. And they do eventually get married, but in this scene that's sort of set in what looks like a medieval church or a medieval castle, she is sitting at her desk about to write something and he has sort of come from behind, has stopped her hand, and then interestingly sort of grabbed her throat at the same time and they are embracing in this passionate moment. So it's an imagined romantic encounter between these two people that, that really had a huge impact on the history of writing because um, her, she kept their letters and, and, um, and they have been studied in, in great detail ever since. So another historical figure that was great fodder for the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood was none other than Joan of Arc. And she was just perfect because she was, she offered up the ability for them to conflate so many of their favorite themes. Uh, references to the medieval past, we've got our armor here and strong, beautiful female protagonists. So this depiction of this patron saint of France is by John Everett Millet, and it's in a private collection. It's such a great image here because we have this moment of penitence. There's such incredible humanity in the face of Joan of Arc here, and she's on her knees, and there's, without, a, without question, she looks as though she is um, seeking guidance from God or, or deep in prayer. And of course, this, this personal 
channel that she had to communicate with God is what ultimately gets her in trouble. She does, you know, lead several battles in the 100 years war, but she's ultimately sentenced to death, um, not only for heresy, but also for dressing like a man. So she was a little bit gender nonconforming back in the 1400s. So um, a really sort of fascinating figure for these pre-Raphaelite artists to take on. Dante Gabriel Rossetti painted Joan of Arc twice. There's about 20 years separating these two images. The first one was painted in the 1860s. The next one was in the 1880s. And in both of these images, Joan of Arc has this massive broadsword in her hands. And, um, and it's sort of tilted up alongside her face. Over here on the right, she's kissing the sword. And she has very strong very masculine features over here. We get the sense that that Joan, who is wearing um, armor, but then uh, with, with uh, a tunic over it, that she is in the middle of praying. We can see the feet of a crucifix right in front of her. Years later, when Rossetti goes back to this subject, he changes it a little bit. Uh, Joan of Arc is not kissing the sword here. She has this long swan-like neck and she's looking upwards. This is more, more about uh, you know, a visionary moment more than a prayer over here. And she's also been um, rendered as you know, devastatingly beautiful now. She's got these big plump lips and big clear blue eyes and long red hair. She is totally sensual at this point. She's gone from the powerful to the sensual over here. Interestingly, this was the, the very last painting Rossetti worked on um, when he was found after he passed away. This was the painting that was sitting on his easel. And it seems like kind of the perfect punctuation point for his entire career because he did love these strong, striking, beautiful redheads like we see here. So one last Joan of Arc that I wanted to share with you is also by Eleanor Brickdale, and it's a completely different take on this heroine here. This is from 1919, and Brickdale shows us Joan of Arc before she becomes a warrior. She is working on a farm. She's a young girl, and Brickdale, uh, in a composition that's almost entirely green, draws our eyes to Joan's face with this red headscarf and these very pink cheeks, uh, uh, highlighting the fact that she's having that she has this very subtle halo. Her hands are clasped in prayer. Her eyes are turned upwards as though she is receiving a uh, vision from God. And I think uh, these black tree branches sort of remind us that something is sort of coming down to her in this moment uh, too. She um, isn't a, a warrior yet, but she is this vessel for God's will and she is full of potential here. It's such a great image. So uh, another famous historical figure, a female protagonist, the, uh, these artists love their female protagonists, is uh, the historical figure of Rosamond Clifford, also known as Fair Rosamond. And she was uh, supposedly the, well, she was the mistress of the King of England back in um, the 1100s, King Henry the, uh, the Second. King Henry was married to Eleanor, who we see over here in the background, but but, um, but was passionate about his mistress. And because in those days, so many marriages were more like um, contracts, financial agreements, whenever there was a passionate romantic love back then <laughs> in medieval times, and I think to, to a certain extent to the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood as well, that was seen as the true love, that was seen as the right thing. So even if there was... Um, there was something untoward about the nature of the relationship. If it was passionate, that was supposed to be the good thing, the right thing, the correct relationship. So in this case, Fair Rosamond is beautiful. She's wearing um, this, uh, again, these angel wing sleeve dresses or dress, and she's got the striking vivid blue here, the long red hair. There are pink roses right next to her, uh, suggesting that this is the first blush of love. And she's waiting for her lover. Her lover, the king, has sort of hidden her away in um, in like a maze, like uh, well, in in a fortified place that has like a maze like path to it. And his wife ultimately finds Rosamond, and we can sort of see that she's using a, a, a thread to find her way there. And something awful is about to happen here. We'll see it sort of come to fruition in this next image. 
by the Pre-Raphaelite artist Ele uh, um, Evelyn de Morgan here. This is uh, a, a later Pre-Raphaelite painting, but when, when the Queen Eleanor finds Fair Rosamond, the mistress of her husband, she brings in a, dag a dagger and a cup of poison, and she basically says, how do you want to die? And so in this painting, she is sort of flanked by these um, uh, darkened, shadowy, monkey-like figures over here. And of course, Rosamond is flanked by these doves and these sweet little angels. So you can see that the artist is, is certainly calling out uh, to who she thinks is um, the favored in this scene. But of course, things do not um, end well for Rosamond, particularly in, in the legend around her. So just a few more uh, images of Rosamond and, and Queen Eleanor. That was a Queen Eleanor that we saw earlier on in the program, carrying the cup of poison and the dagger. Um, this is the painting by Frederick Sandys that we saw earlier. And then on the left, we have a painting by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And this was of um, a model that he had named Fanny Cornwith. She looks very similar to um, his other models who also have red hair. And in this, in this picture, Fanny Cornwith, who was a prostitute, is sort of dressed in the guise of fair Rosamond, waiting for the king, her lover. But in this case, you know, it's as though her dress is sort of falling off of her, her hair is undone. She is, you know, a quintessential depiction of a sexual woman. And that was pretty threatening, pretty dangerous to audience, to Victorian audiences at the time. So, um, so, it, definitely pressing buttons <laughs> by, by creating images of women like this in the guise of this historical figure. So one last historical image I wanted to share with you, and it's such a, such a fantastic image. This is also by Eleanor Brickdale, and it's a depiction of Kate Barless. So this dates to about 1919. Um, Catherine Douglas, who uh, later came to be known as Kate Barless, is a historical figure that tried to prevent the assassination of the King and the Queen of Scotland. Um, this was in the 1400s. So she's in this room with them and they realized that assassins were coming to get the King and the assassins had taken the bolt from the door. And so as the King goes to escape through the sewers and the Queen is, is hiding in the floorboards, Kate, puts her arm through, um, through those holes that would have been how you bar the door. And, um, and she tries to keep that door closed even though assassins are trying to get in. Unfortunately, they break her arm and they do come in and they do find the king and ultimately um, assassinate him. But this is what a moment of heroism here. And it's described so beautifully. It feels like she's in a Gothic style of a castle here, surrounded by the, the tapestries with vivid colors. She's got this gorgeous dress on, angel wing sleeves, red hair, all of the, the signifiers of the pre-Raphaelite movement here. So we've seen religious paintings, historical paintings. Now we're going to turn our attention to literature. Um, so I realize we're getting a little bit short on time, so I'm going to move quickly. These artists were always delving into um, the 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 poetry of their day and then historical texts of the past. So this is actually Rossetti's painting of Dante's dream, um, as in Dante uh, Alighieri, the, uh, the, the poet that, that lived in the 1200s. But he was um, such a romantic figure to the pre-Raphaelite artist because he had this unrequited love of Beatrice. So in Dante's dream, here he is being led by these angels, um, all of them in sort of symbolic colors with symbolic flowers all around them, and he's being led to um, Beatrice's deathbed here. I'm going to just keep moving quickly along just so that you can see Isabella. Is the story of Isabella, which it was uh, a, sort of a galvanizing story, I think, for so many pre-Raphaelite artists. Um, Isabella is a uh, uh, was sort of a uh, renewed interest because of a poem from John Keats, but it's a story from the medieval past. And it's uh, essentially a story of a woman of, of, of noble birth who uh, becomes a uh, it falls in love with a man from a lower station. And you can see in this picture here, she has two brothers who um, are not happy with what's happening with her with, with their sister. They are sort of brutes. One of them is even kicking a dog. And so they are ultimately going to hunt down Lorenzo and kill him. Isabella finds Lorenzo and actually 
decapitates him and buries his head in a pot of basil. You can see the big pot in the background referencing what is going to happen here. This is one of the very first pre-Raphaelite paintings. You can imagine that something like this would have created a real stir, but artists keep going back to it. Typically you see Isabella sort of um, embracing a pot of, ba of basil that she waters with her tears. This is a particularly sensual depiction of Isabella with, a, you know, this uh, a sort of see-through gown here. This is, uh, this version was painted by William Holman Hunt in 1867. We've got another version by William, um, uh, uh, John William Waterhouse uh, uh, we're from 1907 here with the classic angel wing sleeves here. And she is fully embracing the pot of basil as though it is her lover. But of course the skull down below reminds us that Lorenzo is no more. Now Waterhouse has, you know, a, a sort of a, a formula for creating these images. They become pretty easy to recognize. And I think this next image of Miranda from um, Shakespeare's The Tempest sort of falls into that same category. A heroine um, with long, beautiful red hair and a vivid blue dress here, the angel wing sleeves. In this case, he gives us the moment where Miranda is seeing the shipwreck. And, um, and he describes this incredible um, rocky beach that she's standing on with, with all of this uh, beautiful detail here and sort of captures Miranda's heartache in this particular moment. But the literary reference is really the source for this incredible seascape that he's painted here with this beautiful protagonist. Shakespeare is often an, ins an inspiration for these artists. This is Ford Maddox Brown's depiction of Romeo and Juliet, that um, the wonderful sort of last goodbye that they have before he leaves his uh, her room, uh, when they're sort of bantering back and forth, like, is it day? Is it night? Is it the lark? Is it the nightingale? We've got the, the bird right here. And he is about to uh, fly off of her balcony. I love that how his arm is spread out here and he's ready to take leave of her. And even though her eyes are closed and she seems resigned to this, she has sort of locked her fingers around his torso here. There's such an incredible amount of beautiful detail in these pictures. But just because we're short on time, we're going to keep moving. Um, and one last uh, Shakespeare reference for us. This is John Everett Millay's beautiful painting, Ophelia, one of the greatest pre-Raphaelite works of all time painted in 1851. So it's like a signature early work and it's at the Tate Museum. So in this picture, um, we see uh, Hamlet's love interest, Ophelia, after she is um, sinking in the waters, uh, presumably drowning herself uh, upon finding out that her father was murdered by her lover, Hamlet. And so we have our artist here, Millet, who's painstakingly <laughs> recorded the, the landscape around her and then spent months afterwards uh, painting uh, Ophelia in a heated bathtub in his studio. Studio, but he surrounds her with all of these little flowers that all have symbolic meaning. The rose up here, um, possibly referring to the fact that she's referred to as the Rose of May um, in, um, in, in the play. You also have this chain of violets here, which uh, stand for faithfulness, chastity, and death. It could kind of work for any of those. And a poppy down here referring to sleep or death. So it's such a striking image. You definitely feel like this woman is taking her last breath in this moment. Um, just because we're short on time, I'm going to keep going because we have this one last section to go through. And we're going to be thinking about legends and Arthurian legends um, loom large in the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. So we're thinking about these legends that were written in or sort of came about in the 1100s. A lot of them were sort of reimagined again in the 19th century by poets like Tennyson and Keats and Pope. Um, and so these artists, are sort of reaching back into this visual language of an imagined uh, romanticized medieval past. So we have uh, King Arthur on his deathbed in this image here by an artist named James Archer. And um, this was painted in 1860. And as Guinevere is sort of stroking his head, uh, we can see the grail that's being held aloft by this kind of visionary figure. We have the Lady of the Lake who had given Arthur the Excalibur, Merlin over here, all of these references to the River Styx in the background. So it's, it's, 
dense with meaning. We don't even know who some of these female characters are, but we see, you know, the richness in terms of how um, the material world has been um, conveyed here from the animal skin on Arthur's legs to the beautiful details of these women's uh, gowns and dresses here. But this brings us to the Lady of Shalott, which is also inspired loosely by Arthurian legend. And the Lady of Shalott really seems to be um, this kind of galvanizing poem um, that inspires uh, so many pre-Raphaelite artists. This is that image that we started with on the title slide. This is um, by John William Waterhouse from 1916 on the left. Over here, another version from 1894. Now, um, the Lady of Shalott, um, just to sort of summarize what's happening here, she is, uh, she, she's a young woman during our Arthurian times, and she has this sort of uh, imprecise curse on her, where she cannot look at the outside world. She can only look at a mirror reflecting the outside world. And her curse involves having to weave this tapestry of what she sees in the mirror. And then one day, the, um, the knight, uh, the, uh, uh, Lancelot, goes by and she actually looks up and looks out the actual window. And in that moment, everything sort of falls apart for her. And we begin to see just the faintest suggestion of that with, um, with the fact that her mirror is cracked over here. She stood up away from her weaving and she herself is getting all wrapped up in, in the threads that she was using in order to weave her tapestry. You get the sense that she's about to fall over. I love the intensity of this expression here. If you look at it long enough, it really feels like she's looking out at you. The detail over here in the image on the, on the left is just, awe-inspiring to me, but perhaps the best and most celebrated depiction of the Lady of Shalott. We're so lucky it's right here in America at um, the Wadsworth at the name down in Hartford, Connecticut. This is William Holman Hunt's version of the same subject. This is from 1905, so pretty late. And in this moment, the Lady of Shalott has already looked out the window or and, and seen the actual Sir Lancelot, who you can see in the background. The window's cracked and her world is unwinding because of this curse. And so the tapestry that she has been working on, everything sort of becomes weightless, including her hair. All of this is described in this unbelievable detail. And we even have these irises over here on the ground that sort of um, reference the fact that her purity has been stained in this moment. Here's just a gorgeous detail of the Lady of Shalott over here. And you can see Lancelot in the background. So, um, so I do have one last image of the Lady of Shalott over here. This is also by John William Waterhouse. Um, and and it sort of tells us what happens next for her. Okay, so she was weaving a tapestry. She saw Lancelot, what happens next? Well, Waterhouse tells us in this painting, she leaves her tower and she tries to take a boat across the river um, to reach Camelot, but she never gets there. In this moment, we see her sort of just launching from one shore. And it seems as though there's a tapestry on the boat with her. And she has this sort of ethereal feeling to her and a very sort of almost pained, concerned expression on her face and all this long red hair here. Now, whenever I look at this painting, I'm always reminded of that wonderful mini series of Anne of Green Gables where she gets into the boat pretending to be Lady of, the, the Lady of Shalott. And of course, it's just so perfect because she's got her own red hair here. But, um, but these stories or these, that poem in particular by Tennyson certainly inspired so much creative work from the pre-Raphaelite artists. Now, just one last, um, one last uh, legend that I wanted to share with you, and it's it sort of predates Arthur. So there's a lot of different ideas about the source for this legend, but it's the legend of Tristan and Isolde, sort of the forerunner to Romeo and Juliet as the star-crossed lovers. But it is a very intense love. We have John William Waterhouse's depiction of these two lovers over here. And then on the right, um, another version by the artist Edmund Layton from 19. Now, there's a couple of different ways this story is told, but, but essentially Tristan, our knight in shining armor here, was 
delivering Isolde to the king, to his uncle. She was going to marry the king, but they drink a love potion and fall madly in love with each other and then continue to be lovers even after she is delivered to the king and marries the king. In Waterhouse's depiction of this legend over here, it almost looks as though Isolde is, um, is kind of tricking Tristan into this, like, here, share this cup of, of uh, sh share this, this beverage with me. I, I don't know what it is. Um, it's as though she wants him to fall in love with her. Over here on the right, I think she looks a little bit more innocent. And there are different tellings of, of this uh, legend as to just how complicit these lovers were in, um, in having, in sharing this potion, in sharing this spell. But it, it's, um, it's such a great story of, of passionate love. And once again, this was the kind of true romance that these uh, pre-Raphaelite artists really loved as well. So we'll wrap up with the legacy of pre-Raphaelite artists. Um, I wanted to start off with um, William Morris, who we see here um, in a portrait from, I believe this is from the 18... 30s. And William Morris, um, along with several of these other pre-Raphaelite artists, his work tended to uh, tended towards becoming more decorative. And beginning in the 1860s, Morris and other artists began to produce things like murals and stained glass and furniture and textiles. They were more interested in decorative arts inspired by botanical motifs like we see over here. And so, um, so uh, if you're a fan of William Morris like I am, I get a William Morris calendar every year. We have these beautiful patterns. Um, I think he's really well known for these wallpaper patterns. We have even load over here, acanthus wallpaper. These are from the 1870s. But these uh, beautiful sort of dense patterns that look very medieval in so many ways. Uh, we have a peacock and dragon motif over here in wool. And then on the right, we have um, something called granada in velvet. Now, these sort of dense patterns inspired a, a lot of uh, artistic movements at the end of the 19th century, including some of the motifs around uh, Art Nouveau. This is a champagne poster by the Art Nouveau artist Alphonse Mucha. But everything sort of comes back together. It's married back with the fine arts um, towards the end of the 19th century when we see the arts and crafts movement. Now, um, this was a... a, a, a um, a rejection against, against rising industrialism, industrialization, I should say, where things were being mass produced. And between um, the work of, of artists like Morris and, um, and this interest in the decorative arts and the in Art Nouveau, you have all of these artists uh, sort of working in medieval style of uh, guilds who are promoting handmade items, whether it's decorative arts or furniture, like the stickly piece over here on the right or a house like the, the Gamble House um, out in Pasadena that is sort of this arts and crafts design that um, I think is pretty familiar to most of us now. It's really about the handmade. It's a connection back to the natural, the botanical. By the time we get to the 20th century, we see artists like N.C. Wyeth who are... Um, introducing to a whole other generation the medieval past. He learned illustration at, um, at a school taught by Howard Pyle, who was obsessed with prints of, of uh, pre-Raphaelite artists. And so you have N.C. Wyeth giving us images of the boys King Arthur or Robin Hood, like we see over here. And a couple of decades later, you have 1960s counterculture. You have the publication of The Lord of the Rings, where um, even um, Tolkien was sort of interested in these artists from you know, the mid 19th century. Even the first edition cover of the book sort of could pass for a pre-Raphaelite painting. But, um, but but uh, musicians like Led Zeppelin, they were so interested in Tolkien. They were actually collecting pre-Raphaelite paintings and tapestries all along the way too. This is Jimmy Page down here standing in front of a pre-Raphaelite tapestry that he recently loaned to the Tate Britain for an exhibition. And all of this kind of circles back to the 1960s and 70s and, um, and counterculture in general. Look at the way this woman is dressed. I'm not sure if this is Woodstock or not off the top of my head, but she, she looks like she's straight up 
out of a John William Waterhouse painting between the crown and the, and the big sleeves and the belt around her midsection. Um, it seems as though the, these medieval themes that the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood loves so much are just evergreen. And even today, we have people rediscovering them in new ways, adopting them in new ways. So now William Morris tattoos are all the rage if you feel like getting inked. <laughs> and apparently there's a whole decorating style called grandma, Grand Millennial, <laughs> where it's people in their 30s who are decorating their houses to look like their grandmother's houses. They're dense with patterning. And it's thought that William Morris is at the, foref is at the forefront, is at the root of this whole, um, whole style, uh, uh, this whole approach to, to decorating. So these days, I'm happy to say that art historians have a brand new interest in the women who were participating as artists and as models in the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And so there's more and more um, more and more texts being published and more research done on those figures. So it's exciting to think, you know, what this program could look like in five years when I've fully um, digested all of that. But there's so much to unpack when it comes to the pre-Raphaelite painting. And I hope today was a good introduction um, to all of it. Hopefully you come away with an appreciation for the colors, for the details, for the many references, and to the surprising staying power um, of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood in our culture today. So I will end there for now and I welcome any questions or comments that you might have. A, a huge thank you, Jane, to you as, as always, you're so thorough and descriptive and have really done um, amazing work to put this presentation mm -hmm. together. We've got a few questions in the chat. Um, um, they all have something to do with location. Um, one oh. asks the best places to see the pre-Raphaelite works in the U.S. Would you be able to comment on that? Ooh, um, I, I can't think off the, the top of my head of any institution that has a great collection. Um, there might be like a few smatterings around the, the country because most of them really still are in England. And in addition to uh, museums like the Tate, there's one other museum. Let me just pull up the name of it here. And I think it's actually um, the museum that Tolkien used to go to and where he was really exposed to um, pre-Raphaelite artists, the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in Birmingham, England. Okay. That is a great repository. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you for that. Um, someone asks, I don't know if it's for this particular program or just in general, would it be possible to indicate the location of the paintings that you discuss? Would it be possible to indicate the locations? Right. Oh, sure. I, I'm sorry. I try to do that as much as possible but I put this program together about a year ago. And so it was before I'd really gotten into the habit of doing that. But I will say that a, a lot of these are at the Tate or at the Birmingham Museum. Um, if you ever have a question about a specific work that I haven't made that clear about, um, please feel free to get in touch with me afterwards and I'd be more than happy to look it up for you. And uh, another question, again, harkens back to recognizing that most of the holdings are probably in the UK, but about museums in the US that have um, have some of these on display. Um, lots, of course, laudatory comments, um, as one would expect. Um, question that I have, you mentioned um, some of the influences on the pre-Raphaelite group, but mm -hmm. who did they in turn influence going forward? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think for sure, um, Art Nouveau artists, um, they had a huge influence on the arts and crafts movement, as I mentioned. So, um, so I think, I mean, you could even look at architecture by Frank Lloyd Wright and sort of see a little bit of arts and crafts in that. So, I mean, there's, there's an influence here from the pre-Raphaelites in the mid 19th century that goes well into the 20th century um, in terms of what modernism looks like. So, um, yeah, so here's a good example of like a, an Art Nouveau poster that um, all of the, the sort of floral decorative motifs here, it comes from, you know, William Morris and other artists who are really interested in some of that dense patterning that we saw with, um, you know, things like robes and brocaded dresses over here that the pre-Raphaelite artists were exploring. Hmm. 
Interesting. Um, other questions? Certainly the comments, I could not begin to read them all. Just saying how wonderful it is. I love all your programs, Jane. Um, you know, mm -hmm. such a great resource. Uh, lovely presentation. Fantastic presentation. We could certainly um, list all of those. But um, any other questions for Jane or or um, comments? Um, Again, we've put the um, link in the chat for the um, December 4th program on Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. I suspect that's going to be an incredible program. Um, it's from one of my favorites. And yeah, yeah. I mean, this program, it's like we looked at so many artists, so many different kinds of works. And I mean, next month, it's zooming in on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, a single artist. It's, it's but I mean it's a gift to get that close to Michelangelo's work. So it'll be a lot of fun. One last question, and I think you did answer it. Um, why is it called pre-Raphaelite? So the artists were really looking at art that came before the artist Raphael. And maybe I didn't sort of explain that part as clearly as I could have, but essentially, um, sort of Raphael represented sort of an ease of painting, sort of like Sir Joshua Reynolds did, who had founded the Royal Academy. They were revolting against him too. And so they really liked the work that came before Raphael. So artists like Botticelli and even much earlier, sort of medieval artists who were interested in highly detailed elements like uh, Botticelli's depiction of nature over here, um, they were interested in, you know, the layers of storytelling, whether it was references to the classical past or storytelling, what have you. Um, there was just a lot that was happening in the visual world that was, um, to them, really more true and more pure than, than um, sort of the ease and the shorthand that Raphael takes in some ways by, by giving us such a clear and simple co uh, composition in like a picture like the one that you see over here. So pre-Raphaelite really means artists that came before Raphael and were doing a different kind of painting, much more highly detailed, much more nuanced, layered with meaning. <laughs> um, so they were, they're looking to a medieval past, essentially, and um, and they were much more inspired by that work than by the Renaissance, basically. Thank you, um, Jane. So I think we've um, maybe exhausted the, the question um, um, and answer session. It looks like everybody's gotten their um, answers. Um, I'll thank you once again, Jane, and of course the other libraries who are also part of this program. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody on December 4th again. Enjoy the day and thanks again. Thanks for everybody's kind words. I appreciate it. Have a thank great you. day. Goodbye now.